All right, welcome everybody. Um, this is our annual Write Hive conference. This year is packed with a ton of great sessions for writers, writing professionals, and the publishing industry. Write Hive is a nonprofit serving the writing community with free and inclusive resources, events, programming, connections, and more. The 2024 conference brings you this session, Tackling Procrastination and Creating a Routine. If you'd like more content similar to this topic, you can check out Word Nerd Cafe, Episode 70, Storytelling and Gaming, Mental Health, Relax, Escape, and Recharge, or check out Plotting Strategies from the 2021 Write Hive Conference. My name is Kate DeMeo. My pronouns are she, her, and as someone going through developmental edits for my middle grade novel now, I'm excited to hear our panelists' thoughts on tackling procrastination. Welcome, everybody. We'll start with having you introduce yourselves. So I will just go around my screen. And first up is Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Jakes. I am a author of fantasy for teens and adults and uh, recovering from burnout from last year. Not nice, but <laughs> hopefully you'll have some good tips for us. All right, Chelsea. Hello, my name is Chelsea. I go by Sweet and Lockhart on book covers and the internet at large. And I am an author who writes books about Black girls who aren't all that nice. We Are the Origin is the first book in a trilogy, and it's about a group of assassins who have to work together to save the gods and their realm from destruction. I do a variety of writerish things. I run a YouTube channel. I offer coaching services, developmental editing, book formatting, the whole gamut. And yeah, really excited to be here. So thanks for having me. Awesome, exciting. All right, Morgan. Um, hi, I'm Morgan. I write as S. Morgan Burbank, um, and I am an author primarily of science fiction and dystopian works, um, focusing on mental health, sexuality, love, relationships, uh, and various other topics. Um, I also write uh, sapphic visual novels um, under a pen name, and I am a uh, editor who primarily does developmental editing for clients looking to build long-term book series. Cool. Cindy. Hi, my name is Cindy Breck. I write a young adult fantasy romance, actually also uh, romanticy. And I actually have my entire book series and I am looking to launch it next year. And it's the Theron series. Uh, the first book in the series is The Secrets Beneath Scars. And it's about a young protagonist um, seeking the origins, her origins and discovering who she is while well, she unravels conspiracies and stuff. So awesome. that sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sounds like we have a great group to start tackling this topic. Um, our first question is, do you think writers are prone to procrastination? Why or why not? Um, and we will go backwards this time. So Cindy, do you think writers are prone to procrastination? I think that's an individual thing for each person. I personally could be pro, uh, prone to pro procrastination if I have a lot of history, because a lot of my world is grounded in history. Um, and then I want to dive more into the history and then figure that out to make sure that I'm bringing to life something new and original and organic. So I could get into that procrastination procrastination mode where I just don't want to like look at it or just feel overwhelmed or something. So I'll just sit back and be like, okay, I don't want to deal with it. But establishing a routine has really helped me. So right. so for you, it's more about the topic itself. And you, it, it is private. largely, it really is more about the topic. Yeah. Or sometimes outside interference that might interfere, but I learned five years ago to structure my routine. So Morgan, what do you think? Are writers prone to procrastination? I think it depends, uh, like Cindy said, a little bit on the person. Um, I know for me, it was something that I struggled with a lot in the past, um, largely because I had a lot more free time. The more free time I had, the more prone I was to procrastination. Uh, as someone with pretty minimal free time at the moment, I don't procrastinate as much because I know that if I have two hours where I am getting to write, those might be the only two hours I get in a week. Um, so I, I think it is largely driven on a personal basis and can be driven by free time. If somebody's prone to procrastination anyway, they're probably going to procrastinate with their writing. If somebody's prone to burying themselves in work to avoid other stress like me, not that anyone would be like that, um, then yeah, it, it could be the other way too. Awesome. Yeah. So 
depends how much time you have. <laughs> um, Chelsea, do you feel you find yourself like needing to have more pressure in order to get some work done? Um, I would say yes and no, um, mostly because um, I agree with what's been said that it really depends on the person and kind of like how you respond to like pressure and deadlines, because, you know, whether you're traditional or indie or self-published, you're going to have a deadline, whether self-imposed or imposed by someone else. So it's very easy to fall into that procrastination deadline. If you're the type of person who I'm definitely not talking about myself, where, you know, you shut down the closer a deadline gets and you're just like, oh, I'm stressed. I should take a nap, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think, you know, as creatives as a whole, it's very easy to be like, I'll get to it, especially um, like Morgan said, when you have free time, it's very easy to be like, oh, I have time to do it. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And then to kind of put it off because you're like, I have time. And, but the opposite can also be true when you're like, I don't have any time at all. I don't know when I'm going to get this done. I will worry about that in the future. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Publishing future use problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whether your deadline is yeah self-imposed or otherwise can change things too. Um, Kristen, what do you think about if writers are pro are prone to procrastination? Um, I you know a lot of people have said it, it comes down to the individual, and for me, when I was experiencing procrastination woes, a lot of it was tied to being super burnt out. And finding myself in that place where I mentally just couldn't get into a creative space. And so I just kept putting it off and putting it off instead of trying to force myself into it. I had the cleanest house for months, but <laughs> I definitely think that a lot of procrastination tendencies are also kind of tied into your mental state. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. I wish I cleaned when I was procrastinating. Unfortunately, that's not me. Um, all right, so it sounds like we've all experienced procrastination at some point here. Um, what has helped you break that cycle of procrastination? And we'll start back with Kristen. I started by setting really small goals for myself on a daily basis. I started with bare 50 words a day um, and just kind of built off of that. And if I could achieve that, great. I was getting there and I was making words and sometimes I'd get lucky and I'd fall into a groove. And if I didn't meet it, I didn't beat myself up about it either because I was recovering from burnout and, you know, beating yourself up. You just kind of don't want to do it even more because <laughs> you feel like a failure. So I started with small goals and I built on them and, you know, just kind of go from there. That's Get yourself into thing. a daily writing habit. Yeah. 50 words seems, you know, it sounds more doable when you put it like that. Um, what about you, Chelsea? Do you have strategies for breaking the cycle of procrastination? Um, for me, it's more so somewhat accountability. So like I said, I have a YouTube channel. So um, hosting writing sprints has been really helpful for me simply because I'm like, okay, if I schedule this, there are people waiting to do writing sprints with me. Now it's not just about me. And if it, even if I don't personally want to show up now, there's just like a slight pressure to show up for other people. So there's that, but also um, kind of like what Kristen said, setting small goals. And for me, also acknowledging that writing is more than just sitting down at the computer or with your pen and paper, however you write and putting words on the paper. There's things like coming up with ideas and, you know, researching, doing your, your history, coming up with your character and your plots and things like that, Stud like reading for the craft, you know, and finding other materials. And so for me also part of that sometimes it's just like sitting down and giving your space yourself space to be like I'm not going to do anything except sit here and think about my story and that is still a win for me because I'm still actively working on my story it's just not in a way that I can quantify and not beating myself up about it which that guilt can also for me lead to procrastination where it's like the longer I've gone without doing something, the harder it gets to get back into that routine to be like, oh, well, it's already been a week. What's another day? It's Friday. I don't want to start on Friday. I'll just wait till Monday. And it kind of becomes a whole thing. So kind of just and it's months later and you're wondering <laughs> where time went. Right. And so it's like being, being kind to yourself and also, you know, knowing what you need personally for accountability, because, you know, for me, like I said, it's writing sprints, but also 
like I have this thing where I'm like, okay, if I do like a really good word day, if I have like 2000 plus words, I don't have to cook dinner. That's my personal reward because I like to cook, but I'm like, I just worked really hard. (laughs) You know, I can afford to like treat myself to something nice. And that also kind of helps stave off the procrastination. Nice. Yeah. Getting that momentum going, but Mm -hmm. in a different way than just writing makes sense. Um, Morgan, do you have any tips for breaking the cycle of procrastination? So I think uh, similar to what Chelsea said, I try, I, I've tried streaming and that has helped. I do it on Twitch rather than YouTube, but, you know, running, writing sprints has helped at times uh, for me. And, you know, part of my schedule is, you know, I, I work 7.30 in the morning to 4.30. Then I have to get everything ready for kids in the evening, get them fed and whatnot. And, by the time they're in bed and lunches are made for the next day and whatnot, it's quarter to nine on a good day. So that's usually the earliest I'm starting, never mind streaming. And, you know, I am aware that most people, um, just in my experience working with writers, most writers tend to be morning people. And I know that that's not the circle I run in. Everyone is up at 3 a.m., staring at videos of arcane and trying to use it for inspiration um which is much more my scene than the you know ursula Le Guin's who are up at 4 a.m and watching the sunrise and you know being super morning people more power to you if you can do that 4 a.m is for going to bed not waking up but (laughs) um with that said like the onus of putting responsibility not just on yourself but on others who they want to work with you. They want to watch what you're doing, whatever it may be. I found that that has helped a lot um, in trying to put some level of schedule to it, even if you can't necessarily keep it every single week. Like you want to try to, sure. But you may not be able to and being okay with that certainly helps as well uh, because at least there's the structure there to start with. Yeah, that's a good tip. Um, Cindy, do you have tips for breaking the cycle of procrastination? Well, I'm, I think differently. I come from a background of um, recreational therapy. So I know, as um, Kristen was talking about, the, the mental, the thinking, and um, burnout and so forth, um, I have learned that it's not just the mental aspect that you have before you enter and engage into a writing project or something, but it's the atmosphere that you're sitting in. It's the environment that you're sitting in and how um, inviting it is. I'm not talking about appearances, but how much of that space is yours that you identify with that is your story. The surrounding that you write in motivates you. If you've got your computer there, you've got your coffee cup there, you've got your board, your whiteboard that says, hey, these are the tasks I need accomplished. Hey, those things are what keeps you motivated. I only have to finish my responsibilities that I have around the house, get things done. And then once I enter through that threshold, it's like, I'm a new person. It's like the muses start clicking and it's just like, I don't know, there's just something that just comes alive when you're in your own space, you own your own identity, you're sitting down in front of that computer and it's like these voices, the muses as I refer to them, just start clicking and they're like, okay, you know, I'm ready to go. You ready? Okay. So I think it's a lot stems from not just your mental thinking, but also the environment that you write in. And I think for me, I've written where I've been in a coffee house. I've written where I've been in groups and we're doing writing sprints or I have written because my husband like, okay, let's get you a space to have for yourself. That space, that writing sanctuary, that has been a blessing to filter and help me um, to stop procrastinating. I want to go there. I want to like be in my space, my zone, you know, physically, mentally, and emotionally. So that's, that's usually what works for me. Nice. Yeah, it makes sense if you have a place you want to go to. Um, you guys are bringing up more questions for me, so I'm going to kind of riff off of that. Um, based on Cindy and Morgan's answers, I'm curious, um, do you have a, you know, a time where, of day where you do write more or a time of week where you do write more, and do you have a dedicated writing space um, to do that? So we'll start with Kristen. 
man, I would love a writing yurt. <laughs> but uh, I usually, uh, I don't really have a dedicated space because, you know, we live in a smaller apartment space. Um, so I often, sometimes I'll steal away to the library if I need to get out of there. And it helps me get out of like the trapped kind of headspace of being in the apartment all the time. Um, and I find I write best in the morning and in the night. So like early, early morning and late, late at night. Is it because of the, is it more quiet at those times or just your brain is sort of just working more focused during that, those hours? It might have a lot to do with, um, you know, it being more quiet and the kiddos, you know, either not being awake or away, you know? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Chelsea, do you have a dedicated space or a schedule you try to stick to? Uh, for sure. Um, I have a dedicated space because it's just me and my husband. So um, I was able to turn one of the bedrooms in our house into an office space. So, you know, really fortunate for that. Um, and as far as, you know, keeping a schedule, it's like, for me, it's Thursdays. I have learned over time that it's just like, um, I'm not really good at time blocking. I'm not, I suck at time management just like as a whole, but especially when it comes to like, oh, I'm going to be creative because it's like, you know, especially as an indie author, you have to manage all of the things. And so there's always something that needs to be done. There's an email that needs to be written and sent. There's, you know, a DM to respond to. There are things to be researched, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I've learned that just blocking off an entire day where it's like Thursdays are my day where I don't do, I don't make any outside commitments on those days so that I can essentially, you know, follow the muses. I can be in my space and I can do what needs to be done. Um, and then I also try to block off time during the week. Um, but those, that's a little bit more flexible because, you know, I have a podcast channel and I have like coaching clients and things. And so I have to kind of have some flexibility in my schedule to account for different things. And for me, it's also, you know, being aware that I'm in a very fortunate position where it's like, I can pursue writing full time. And so kind of accepting that I can write in the middle of the day when my husband's at work and just be like, okay, this works for me. This is the time that I have blocked off. But, you know, I've also found that the time that I'm most creative is usually sometime after nine o'clock. I don't know. I'll just be like, oh, what are words all day, all day? Nine o'clock is just like, oh, I have the most brilliant thing for a like five book series. Let's go. And then, you know, midnight hits and I'm like, what are words? I don't know. Maybe I should go to sleep. <laughs> Try again tomorrow. <laughs> nice. Maybe it's that post-dinner energy or something. Um, Maybe. I, I think if you have a trilogy, your your time management's already great. <laughs> so, um, okay. Yeah. Um, do you all have accountability partners and how do you leverage that dynamic? Um, I think probably we'll start with Morgan this time. Um. I don't know that I have accountability partners so much as I have editing clients. Um, and I, I know that's a weird sentiment, but go with me on this. So um, I was an editor long before I started writing. Um, I did, uh, I, I got into editing weirdly enough, starting by doing resume and podcast editing. It had nothing to do with creative writing. It was just, I had an audio engineering background and people paid me to edit resumes. It's like, cool. And, you know, over time that kind of morphed into, okay, well now can you look at this short story I'm doing or can you look at this book? And, you know, I end up getting editing clients that way. And in building those relationships with editing clients, um, you know, we get to talking about whatever, get an understanding of what they're writing, whatnot. And they ask about what I'm writing and they, those editing clients, why not across the board like this they tend to be some of the people who are the most vocal about when is your next book coming out and then you know i'm crying in the corner until i can answer them because i have not started on it um and you know i think that having having folks who have an interest in it, even if they're not like you know somebody who shows up and they're on you know every single stream body mirroring you whatever it may be like i've never had something like that by any means. um but you know, just having people that have an interest is enough to drive accountability in a lot of ways that you don't really think. Not necessarily because it puts you to, oh, you need to be able to do 200 words a day or, you know, insert your own goal number here. But because it 
gives you the energy to be like, oh, hey, someone cares about what I'm writing. I'm going to finish this so that I can show it to them. Yeah, having a support system is a great way to to have that motivation. Um, Cindy, do you have accountability partners? Yes and no. Maybe not in the respect. Um, some people I know, accountability partners, they do writing sprints together. Um, I actually do not have accountability partners, but I actually have a writing guild that I'm more like Morgan where I'll interchange and exchange stuff there. Or I would have said to, to my agent, that kind of stuff. And that feedback does greatly inspire you. It keeps you going. But to sit back and say that I have a, a physical person that I'm accountable to, no. But I am driven by every other Thursday night, hey, you got to have something to share with the group. It's got to be con clear, concise. It's got to flow. And then that drive of when they give that feedback is fantastic. And it just keeps you going and stuff like that. So that's kind of where I'm at. Nice. What about you, Chelsea? Any any accountability partners? Uh, kind of same as everyone. <laughs> yes and no. Um, a lot of my accountability comes from the writing sprints that I host on my channel on Thursdays, um, mostly because even though it's not like I, as I'm the only one on screen, there are still people who show up every Thursday and it's like, hey, I can see their updates in the chat and I can tell them about my stuff. Um, but as far as like personally, um, at similar to what Cindy said, I have what I call the author council, which is um, me and three other authors. And we basically are like, we are all moving in the same direction, slightly at different paces. Like we're all at different stages of the publishing process, but, you know, keeping up with each other. Um, one of my author friends is actively drafting her book. So, you know, every, whenever she has a new word count, she just drops it in her specific channel in our discord server. And she's like, this is where I'm at. And, you know, know when um one of my other friends was getting her cover it's like hey this is what I'm doing what do you guys think how about the text what do you think of the artwork etc so the accountability is more so am I still moving towards my goal at the pace mm -hmm. that I feel like I should be moving at so that I feel like I'm still contributing to these group of people where we have decided to come together and mutually support each other even if it's not a word count update or we're not doing writing sprints together. And sometimes we do, but we're very spread out like <laughs> globally. So it's just like, ah, you're in Spain. I am <laughs> sleeping right now. <laughs> um, and do you find within those groups, is it mostly um, people sort of taking accountability for their themselves? Like they feel internally like they need to post that word count a day, or is it more um, you're checking in with that person in Spain saying, hey, did you get your words done this month or so? Um, I think it's for us more so personal accountability. I have been in groups where it was like external accountability where everyone, every so often there was like a chat, like, hey, how's everyone doing? Where are you at? Um, but I have found that for me personally, having a certain level of personal accountability and just being like, I want to be able to share. I want to be able to talk to them about it. I want to be able to be like, Hey, this is what I've learned. The, this is a really cool opportunity that I found to like hey, get your book in a bookstore or, you know, what have you is a lot more impactful for me personally. And I also found like it's less stressful. Cause like I said earlier, sometimes having that stress of, I have to do this inherently makes you not want to do it you know okay Kristen do you have accountability partners yeah oh yeah <laughs> to go with the group sort of um <laughs> I, I have kind of like a discord group a couple of them you know where we go and we yell and cheer each other on and you know um have a place to howl out if we need to like I'm so stuck um you know and people that can you know zoom and vibe with each other if they need to be so just having that support group kind of, it, it means the world because it doesn't matter where we are and state-wise or world-wise, but you know, we're there to support each other as needed. Um, going off of this question too, how did you all find these people that you're connecting with? Was it through social media or um, just word of mouth? Um, and I guess I'll start with Kristen since you just... <laughs> Uh, just groups of fellow authors that kind of came together, like that we're all in kind of situ similar situations. So, Chelsea, you raised your hand. <laughs> yeah, um, only because I kind of run into this question a lot because 
it's one of those things where I think collectively on the internet, we talk about community and how finding your community is really important, especially as an author, because inherently what we do is very individualistic. We're all kind of in our rooms, in our spaces that we've curated by ourselves (laughs) at the end of the day, having to sit down and do the thing. Um, But for me, um, a lot of it was social media, but also kind of opening, I don't say your worldview, but like sometimes the people that you least expect to be authors are also the people who are like, no, I resonate with what you're doing the most. So um, for my author council, um, one of, I guess it's three people. One of them is my cover artist. I was just like, oh, and she read the book because um, just fun fact, if your cover artist is willing to read your book to create a cover specifically for you, let them, free advice. Um, (laughs) She was really great. She writes her own books and we met that way. and, but another one, we lived in the same city for like five years, never met each other until I moved to the other side of the United States. And it was just like, and then we met on social media. Um, and the last person she joined in my writing sprints, and she was just like, oh, I really like your energy. And I was like, oh, I like you too. That's great. And it kind of came together and it was a nice meshing of people. But I've also been in groups where it was just like, you know what? I like you as an individual, but this group is not working for me. So wish you all the best but I'm going to exit stage left right I think it definitely comes down to matching energies oh yeah Yeah. it really does and meeting people being around people who are willing to meet you where you're at so like if you know that you're the type of person where you need external accountability someone asking you once a week have you done the writing or where are you at you probably shouldn't be in a group where everybody just kind of casually touches base and if you're looking for genuine friends because like Kristen said willing to hop on a zoom call or a discord call and just chill and vibe and drink wine and be like did y'all see what happened on twitter this week you know if you if that's what you're looking for then maybe not be in a server where people are like pure writing 100 percent of the time every interaction every conversation is that you kind of have to find what works for you and also be willing to leave spaces that aren't serving you and not I don't want to say have introverted guilt, like, oh my God, these are the only friends I have. I'm not going to find anymore, but also not give into the introverted guilt of not finding your community. I get really passionate about it. So that's my rant. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. (laughs) A little bit of (laughs) trial and error and important to find your people. That's great. Um, So we've been talking a a bit about writing sprints. So I know at least some of you definitely use them. Um, How does that help you in your creative routine? Um, Cindy, did you use writing sprints at all? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I actually was introduced to writing sprints about four years ago when a friend of mine and I get together in physical groups and social media groups, but um, she had come over and we just finished a focus group and she was like, Hey, have you heard about this writing sprint thing? I was like, okay. So um, we just did it together. And it was just like, your mind could just like slip into the 45 minutes that you want to write something that creative aspect comes out and then it's like the 15 minutes that you might allow yourself to leave the desk and go take care of something also makes you feel like you're accomplishing something around the house and doesn't feel like you're grounded to a seat or anything i feel that i could explore more create more when i've got the writing sprints and i'm and i'm doing them because it seems like when you're up and you can get your brain stimulated doing things and then it's like you sit down it's like it's like the muses just start working so freely and the dialogue just comes so naturally when you when you're writing and stuff and a lot of the times I will take a notebook get all my images out of my head at night and then when I go to do my writing sprint I will sit down I'll glance at that and it's just like it's a a rainfall the visions just come exploding through and my fingers just start hitting the keyboards and I just start going. So I, it's kind of the writing sprints have really aided me so much more um, the last four years since I've known about them than the procrastination of what do I write about? What do I do? It's almost like there's a pattern built and my brain is triggered and trained to work with that. So nice. Um, Morgan, do you participate in writing sprints and how did those help you? It depends on what I'm writing as to how much they help. Uh, I find that the sprint type sessions help a ton while I'm editing. Uh, for the reason Cindy very much said, it's focus, take a moment to you know, refocus doing whatever else and go back. It helps a lot with editing, 
helps a lot when I'm doing uh, a lot of the visual novel coding because that is much more dialogue driven, less world building driven. For the novels I write, I cannot do sprints. Um, I, I need I need to be able to focus on what I'm doing, and there'll be nights where I lose, you know, three four hours in my night and realize it's two a.m. and it's like, oh well, I mean, you know, I wrote a couple thousand words or whatever, but uh, there was there was no break. My coffee has gone room temperature, you know, those types of things. Um, sprints don't work as well for that because uh, a lot of what I've written historically from a uh, longer fiction standpoint is part of the same series and whatnot. So it's, you know, making sure I'm in the understanding for the world that I've created, being consistent with it, everything along those lines, even drafting, it's real hard to do a sprint for that. So for me, it, the sprints, yes, they absolutely are helpful, but it's very contextually based. I think what's great about this panel is, you know, not everything's going to work for everybody, but you all have great tips about, you know, different ways you can try try out different things because if, if you try writing sprint maybe and you're you are drafting and it doesn't work it doesn't mean you know give up and <laughs> don't do any more writing sprints necessarily um and chelsea you definitely mentioned writing sprints so how have those helped you um writing sprints have been game changing for me <laughs> not gonna lie um mostly because it's okay I get distracted very easily. I know this about myself. I will be like, oh, I'm just gonna look up what this character's wearing real quick, Pinterest, two minutes, two minutes, 30 minutes later, an hour later. And I'm like, ah. okay. So <laughs> having a timer there and being like, okay, I can literally see the time ticking down. I need to compartmentalize this. I need to hang this up for later, come back to it. And um, I'm actually the opposite of Morgan. I'm like, if I'm drafting, I could do sprints all day I could be like okay let's go let's because I kind of make a game of it and I'm like okay how many words can I get this sprint and kind of challenging myself to push myself to the higher word counts and not get too in my head about oh what's happening does this line up with what was in what I put in the first book you know does this visually make sense that I'm like that's a problem for future Chelsea future Chelsea makes it make sense current Chelsea just needs to get it on the page right but for editing, that is when I hit, like Morgan said, I will hit the, the block. I am completely dead to the world. I am locked in for three, four hours. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't even bother get, making coffee anymore because I'm like, just get the water. It's, <laughs> it's going to be room temperature by the time I actually remember that I have it. So um, I, I really like sprints for, like I said, that drafting piece and also the community piece of just being like, okay, I got, you know, 300 words, 400, 500 words, this sprint and being like, okay, if I'm hitting these word counts consistently, that means I can, it's something tangible that I can see at the end of the day to be like, I did something today. Okay. And being able to just be like, I need to focus for 30 minutes. That's it. <laughs> That's it. After that, you know, we can take a break. <laughs> we can figure it out. And I also like the flexibility of being like, um, when I do sprints, I do at least three, at least three, no less. But I'm like, if I can go longer, then let's do more. So that's also kind of like, oh, I did five sprints today. Good job, Chelsea. <laughs> Kristen, do you use writing sprints? Uh, yeah, when I was in the uh, burnout recovery ward, I often would use Pomodoros, which was the 27 minutes, and then you take like a five minute break, and then you keep going for another 27 minutes. Or I would just do one Pomodoro, and then I would give my brain a break because, you know, sometimes you can only get 50 words in that 27 minutes. <laughs> um, and then, you know, it really helps uh, to just like regain some focus and regain concentration ground because you know, the day gets really chaotic and spun out, but I can take 27 minutes to sit down and write something. Even if everything else spirals out of control after that, I still manage to sit down for 27 minutes. Sure. Also, can I add to that, that um, a really good tool is called Flocus, F-L- O-C-U-S. It's a free tool and you can, it comes with the different backdrops that you can choose. It also comes with like rain sounds, ocean sounds, cafe sounds that you can choose from. And if you have Spotify, you can connect it for like background music or whatever, but you can set the time for the sprints and it'll do that for you automatically where it'll give you um, like four 
short breaks and then a long break and you can set exactly how long you want those to be so you can kind of customize it for yourself and it's a super it I was about to say super free um it is a free app (laughs) that you can download to your computer so you don't have to have an actual um browser window up if you're one of those people who gets distracted by having the internet up so wanted to let you guys know about it yeah sounds like you can use it for things other than writing even potentially sure Uh, Maybe as a way to set up, you know, if you don't have a dedicated space, set up dedicated mind space to get that going. Um, So are there any other tools that you guys have found helpful in creating routines or overcoming procrastination that we haven't talked about so far? (laughs) Kristen, Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I saw two hands now. Go ahead. Um, I'm also a big gamer and I found a couple of games that kind of incorporate like writing sprints and like writing, setting writing goals. So like that helped me because it kind of fed like that need to procrastinate and game while at the same time also forcing in a production productive element. So uh, one thing that I just picked up was like the lo-fi uh, spirit city lo-fi sessions, uh-huh. which is adorable and you get to like customize it. And it gives you space to like get your creative gaming side out and then also do writing stuff on the side. That sounds really cool. Yeah, Yeah. I just got that one. I just got that one as well. Uh, There's another one, Cozy Corner, that offers a little bit more customization and timers than a lot of them. Um, I used that one up until recently, but my laptop didn't like streaming with it. So, you know, ended up going the other one. as dumb as this is going to potentially sound, I find that one of the things that really helps me with productivity is literally just writing in a relatively no frills thing. So I know that people love Scrivener, World Anvil, et cetera, et cetera. And those are great tools. Um, I use some of them myself. I find that I tend to be the most productive if I'm writing in Word or if it's the game in Visual Studio Code. Like it's just less distracting. I second that. Um, I use Dabble um, mostly because they advertise themselves as like Scrivener Lite. So it's like there are features, but they have a focus mode. So it's just like you don't see anything else and you can full screen it. So you don't have to do anything else. But it also has a cloud upload, which I'm very grateful for because my power absolutely did go out in the middle of drafting. I was like, dear Jesus. And it was terrifying. Um, But I recommend having like a good software that you are familiar with that you're not trying to learn as you're trying to like write and draft that if you need that one note, you know exactly how to get to that note and then get back into what you're doing, especially if you keep them digital. Um, I like Dabble because you can set your goals for it and then it'll give you a nice little, um, it'll give you a nice little pop and be like, good job and give you a little confetti. Um, And I find that person to be really motivating, especially for the days when I'm just like, I don't want to write, I don't want to do this. It's like, okay, well, at least this is something to to strive for, you know, something to sit down and be like, I'm going to, to try to do this. Um, I also use um, personally Notion. I have a template, like a database set up where I can keep track of the day and how many words I got for that day. Um, I also have it set up so that I have like my ultimate word count for the project. So I can actually see the progress bar going up over time, but being able to, for me, being able to see, you know, how far you have gone and like what days you've logged in and what days you didn't is also really helpful and just motivating to be like, especially, I don't know if we, if this is like a, a me thing or just like a writer thing that I haven't seen a whole lot of people talk about, but when you hit the middle of the book and you're just like, I loved this story in the beginning and I know what needs to happen at the end, but right now I'm just like, should I be doing this? Is this the project that I need to finish? And when you hit that, like, do I even want to write to the end of this book thing? I don't know. It's like a, it's like a slog, whatever. It's really helpful to see how far you've come. And it's like, oh, I'm almost there. I, I have less than half of the book left to write to hit my, my goal. Um, I also find that that's really, really helpful with staying focused and not being eaten up by procrastination and keeping with your routine. I love how many people use Notion in completely different ways. Um, like for that, that's a project 
a tool I recommend to clients that are like trying to do longer form drafting because there's so much you can do with like structuring um, that like, I love how many different ways you can use it. Even, even if it like, isn't the most, the most useful tool for me, just that there's so many people I've seen do really good stuff with it. So I like that a lot. Oh yeah. Would not recommend writing in it because your format oh, no. will not transfer. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> do not try to write in it, but it's, it's really good for, um, if you, I keep my story Bible there. And like I said, I keep my database of my word counts there, images and things like if you create playlists, really great place to keep all of that. Um, slight learning curve, but also free and we love free. <laughs> so <Be> free. free. <laughs> Cindy, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I don't actually use any apps, any tools or anything like that. I do use a uh, timer. I use a whiteboard. I use the three plot structure. I use um, sticky notes to write my uh, scenes on. And I go from there because then I could take those scenes and change them around. I kind of run off the Scott Bell method of doing things because I know certain scenes are uh, important and I don't want to be like Chelsea said trying to learn a new piece of equipment because it's the latest and greatest thing and just finding the old thing worked for me, which is Word and just moving forward. But I do a lot of switching around to um, on the whiteboard with color coded notes, uh, sticky notes to make sure things fit and stuff like that. And I um, usually draft, mentally draft, mind map outside my uh, writing sprints. But when I sit down for my writing sprints, I usually do three or four of them, run right after the other. Um, like Chelsea said, I when, when I'm down to sit, I am down to sit and I'm down to get out. And my last book was um, 138,000 words. And that takes me a while to write. But then I also have to balance that out with family, like everybody else seems to be doing too. Yeah, you know, sometimes just pen and paper is the way what helps people get through things. Um, how do you recommend individuals stay accountable and track their progress in establishing and maintaining a routine? Um, let's start with Kristen. If you have, um, <laughs> I I often uh, I hold myself accountable. I have a daily planner. And I often will record my goals or I will record what I've accomplished for that day. Sometimes it's blank. <laughs> and sometimes I am able to put some words that I, I wrote down. Like I wrote two, some 200 something this day. I wrote 500 something this day. And, you know, at the end of the week, I, you know, you look back and you see that you did accomplish something. So that is how kind of I manage to keep myself on track. <laughs> Morgan, how do you hold yourself accountable or track progress? So I used to do what Kristen was saying. Um, I had a digital planner type thing that I used. And one of the things that I found was not good for my mental health was seeing the blank days, as dumb as that sounds. Um, it, it, it made it a struggle for me because it's like, oh, well, I've had three straight days of not being able to do anything for, you know, whatever life reason came up. And it's just like, oh this is not conducive to me feeling like I'm doing a good job. Uh, so I scrapped that. And largely what I've gone to doing is, you know, just setting some sort of, you know, individual like deadline. So um, with the game writing that it gives me a nice thing to do because it writing a game by yourself is uh, not something I recommend in retrospect. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, what, what it's done is allowed me to put out releases. So basically, I can be like, okay, well, I'm going to do the next release of this game. This point, having some sort of deadline to that gives me structuring that doing the deadline method uh, has done more good for me than the regular tracking. Um, there are drawbacks to that, especially if I'm not in a position where I can pace myself um, or if I have something else that comes up in the interim. Um, but you know, I see it as a trade-off for a better mental health, typically. Chelsea, do you have tips for holding yourself accountable? Um, 
first tip is to evaluate, like really sit with yourself, not what anyone tells you or what you think it works or what works for your friend, your mom, your sister, us even just kind of really sit with yourself and be like, okay, what do I need to hold myself accountable? Because, you know, between Kristen and Morgan, you know, Kristen said she needs a planner and Morgan was like, they need to see that they have deadlines and need to not see the blank face. So sit with yourself and know what needs to work for you. But then also um, for me, right, I can tell you that it was setting aside a day because I think as writers, we kind of all have at some point or another have heard or will hear, you need to write every day if you're a writer, right? That's the only way to be a true, genuine (laughs) professional, right? But it's also like, if that's not for you, if that's an unrealistic expectation, just acknowledge that, accept that, and then be like, what is a realistic expectation? And then set that goal for yourself. And I would say also to start small when establishing your routine. If you're trying to get up to writing five days a week, an hour, five days a week, cool. And you're writing currently zero hours for zero days a week. I would not start out (laughs) with that. Start out with, okay, I'm going to write for 30 minutes twice a week cool. Then bump that up. And then whether you need to get your timeline, like whether you need to work up to that hour, two hours that you want to work to first for one or two days, or you need to get to those five days set aside time and then extending it out, whatever works for you, go for that. Um, and then as for tracking your yourself to see your accountability, um, write it down because you absolutely for sure will not remember. Um, for me, I, like I said, I like to use Notion. That's my current obsession before Notion. I used a uh, Google calendar and you could just put an event or a task at the top of the day and be like, hey, I did this, boom, and then move on. And then you can kind of look back on it and kind of see what you've done. Or like I said, Dabble, Scrivener, there's a ton of software. Pick your gadget, right? It'll, it'll track it for you. Um, but just having some way to look back at that or even writing, I know I have friends who have write down what chapter they're on, on certain days. So it's like, oh, I wrote chapter 13 this day. I wrote chapter 14 this day. I wrote chapter 15 this day, et cetera. Great. Um, Cindy, do you have uh, ways that you stay accountable? I have a designated boards that I talk to you about, like, and through my stages, depending on which book I'm in, I actually have six of them, but um, I have a board that says ongoing projects. So like if I'm giving a speaking engagement, I got to um, go ahead and write uh, uh, something up. I have that, all the structures, I need that down. I also have like the three act structure board. I've got that set up. Um, and then I have like boards, like if I have a podcast I'm going to be at or things like this. But I also have this ongoing list of things that just need done in the story. And when I enter the room, depending on the time that I have, I look at it like Chelsea's saying, you evaluate what works for you. And I think, well, I've got two hours here. What can I tackle out? And mentally, if I'm in that mindset, that's what I gravitate towards. You know, I kind of take things out off the list as I go and just erase it as it's done. And then I have the document in my um, computer and then I'm fine. But that's, I'm old school but that's pretty much how I do it. So that's how I, I, I'm a, I, lo, I like lists, but I also make sure that at the same time, I've got my household responsibility done because otherwise that will carry into my personal writing space. So I make sure chores, everything like that's done. So when I'm sitting down, I'm free of stress. I'm free of worry about other things having to be done, whether it's there's a crock pot in the meal I don't have to cook on that Thursday night. I'm totally like free to write. And there's some times that I'll write five hours, 10 hours. And so it just depends. But very rarely do I skip a day of writing, doing something related to my projects. Yeah. No, I think this is this is a great panel. So everybody does have their own methods and tips. <laughs> but that's what to- works. That's what's so beautiful. Yeah. Not right. You don't have to have one method that works. Mm-hmm. it's it's to each their own yeah so. I like the crock pot method <laughs> put something in for a couple hours and go yeah most fun. definitely yeah Kristen you raised your hand yeah I just wanted to kind of piggyback off of what Chelsea was saying um 
and I can't stress it enough is like, especially if you are recovering from burnout and trying to get through a, like a procrastination in general, it's the small, slow build and doing yep. things in increments and building yourself up in increments and your product productivity up in increments. If you jump into anything, trying to do a ton all at once, trying to go from zero to 50, <laughs> it's it's kind of setting yourself up to fail so you know as no matter what method you choose take it in small steps i 100 percent agree because i think sometimes as authors as writers as creatives we forget that being creative is a skill like there's talent involved for sure but it is a skill and just like you wouldn't decide oh today I am going to be a bodybuilder and then go to a gym and try to deadlift 200 pounds when you have never lifted that before you shouldn't do that with your writing either you shouldn't be like okay I've never sat down or I've never written 5,000 words in one sitting I've only my max word has been 500 right it's an unrealistic expectation to think you're going to write 10 times that simply because you decided in your mind that today is the day that I'm going to do it. You have to build your stamina. You have to get used to being in the chair, being focused, whether that's for long periods of time, like you're locking in three, four hours, whether that's, you know, sprinting, whatever it is, you have to kind of accept that it, it's okay if it takes time. And I think also what's really important is when you're talking about accountability and keeping a routine is being kind to yourself and giving yourself grace for when you don't meet that expectation for yourself and just acknowledging that part of this journey is also being human and falling short of the goal sometimes. And it's like, it's okay. You know, I wanted to write today. I wanted to get a hundred words. I only got 20. Cool. It's 20 more than you had before you sat down, you know, or even if you have one of those writing days where it's like, oh, I wanted to get, you know, 500 words in, I ended up deleting 300 of them. You know what? It's 300 words you didn't need. And that's okay. Because in the course of that time, you did something and you got better at what you did because you're now able to look at your writing and recognize that you have things that you don't need. That's a, that's still a win, you know? So giving yourself grace and space to be human and creative and, you know, understanding it's not just a linear projection for your creativity. I think the another thing to keep in mind too, uh, with Kristen talking about burnout, um, there's times that I think all authors go through a period of time that they get stressed out. But I think um, when you're sitting down and you're writing something and your mind's not in it, but you're forcing yourself to write it. And it's just like, you're, you're, you're just like trying to get the gears going and stuff like that. And you write something down and you, you, you pitch it. You actually sometimes, even though you burn out, that piece of paper that you wrote or that it, whether it's in a computer or on a piece of paper, because I know people do it both ways, that is so valuable because you could layer that actual scene that you wrote into something else. So just because you're burnt out, whether it's 20 words, 50 words, or a thousand words, that is still valuable. So I would recommend to nobody to get rid of their darlings. Little things like that are so important because you could use those somewhere else in your craft, in your story. Oh, one of those things. Hmm? Yeah. I was going to say, keep a graveyard. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I know some of my best stuff I wrote when I was just mentally tired and stuff like that, but it was the skeletal bones of it. It wasn't like a fully developed understanding, but it was like, okay, wait, stop, don't throw it away because you could really layer something in with that or put it into a, a, a total different scene that totally shifts and makes a, a dynamic twist. But still, I mean, you just have to, um, as authors, you have to know who you are and what you stand for, what you um, represent, and what pushes your buttons, what motivates you, and what slows you down. And you have to be careful to stay on track and, and not burn yourself out or anything like that. I mean, it's 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 a double-edged sword in so many ways. I think one of the things that has been, that was interesting you brought up there was the don't throw anything away. Like it, it's an idea that people don't always realize how helpful it is. Like I had a, I, I tried writing a short story back right when I first started actively taking writing seriously. This was 2010, 2011. I don't remember exactly when I wrote this short story. And I wrote this and it was, 
a short story I never finished and didn't really like the concept, but there was a character I really liked out of it. And I'm like, okay, well, even if that story is not great, let's, you know, take this character and use her somewhere else. And, you know, for the better part of 12 years, I'm like, I have no clue where to use her because she didn't make sense in anything I was writing. Um, and then, you know, I finally found something to use her in last year. And it's like, even if an idea doesn't work now, does not explicitly mean it will never work. Um, and finding a place for that matters. And I think that that's something that I've learned. Uh, Cindy, you just brought up, you know, know who you are as a writer, know your convictions, your beliefs and whatnot. Um, and I think that one of the things, especially if there's anybody who's attending who is a newer writer, um, one piece of advice I would give is you're not going to necessarily know who you are right away, as dumb as that may sound. Um, like, I, in retrospect, I, a part of the reason I really like that character is just because she was fun to write, yes, but, um, like, I, I resonated with her in ways I didn't recognize, you know, when I was 22 or whenever it was, I started writing that character, um, that, you know, being in my mid-30s, it's like, oh, no, no, I, I, I see in retrospect why that character is so interesting to me, that, like, it's, just because you have an idea doesn't mean it's bad. And just because you don't know what you're doing with your writing and whatnot doesn't mean you should stop writing. Mm -hmm. Keep trying to help you figure it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think what some people don't understand about the whole concept of procrastination is that some of the reason why we do as authors procrastinate is because we are evolving through our stories. Our perceptions are what is being put on paper. And so as we're writing a character, that character is taking on some of our identities, our personalities, or the perceptions of people that work around us. And so you're crafting and um, putting this, laying this story out, and it's got bits and pieces of you and other people. And sometimes that procrastination can slow you down. But I think as the more you get into knowing who you are, what you're writing, that story becomes to flow more because whether it's you know your identity or the perception your character should be having it just seems to flow so much easier I mean I think even Chelsea you you kind of touched on some of that oh, yeah I mean the thing is I am one of those people where I say I write books about black girls who aren't all that nice because that is what resonates with me you know in the life that I've lived and the things that I've gone through but also it's one of those things where it's just like that looks different and changes over a time because even with We Are the Origin, which is the first book of my trilogy, right? I rewrote that book like seven times, like from start to finish, got rid of 40,000, 60,000, 70,000 words. Mm -hmm. And when I was just like, you know, because I started writing the idea for the character came to me when I was 20. I was, you know, fresh out of grad school, decided to withdraw fail. Ooh, that's so fun. Parents super proud. And I also, you know, got married, moved across the country, just doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't in the best place mentally. And I was just like, you know, a lot of times, you know, I don't see characters who are having the emotional turmoil that I am experiencing you know, on page while they also look like me. I'm not saying those stories don't exist. I just hadn't seen a black woman be depicted being able to be upset and angry and changing in the ways that I wanted to tell stories. And so I was like, this is what I'm going to write. But as I have been in this career, as I've been writing stories and as I have been exploring the way that I view the world and my, my perspective of the world is changing because the way that I viewed it when I was 20 is no longer how I view the world Correct. now that I'm pushing 30. It's like, okay, it's okay to, to see that perspective and to change and to, like you said, look back at what I have written, things that I kept, things that I didn't and be like, this is where I was. These, there are some things that are gems that I'm like, for sure, I want to reuse this. I want to talk about this. I want to add this. I want to, I, as I like to call them, zombify it, right? Resurrect it from the graveyard and put it in something <laughs> else. But it's also like giving myself space to be like this current project that I'm working on. The characters are nothing alike. The topics that I'm discussing are different. The way that I'm approaching some things are different because I've, I've grown as a person and as 
you grow as a writer, as you become more involved in the community, as you interact with more people, as you see how different people approach the craft of writing, you become a mishmash of those things and you take mm-hmm. it and you learn from it and you incorporate it into your own writing. It's part of the reason why, you know, as writers, we're always like, you need to read, like not just what you used to love as a kid, but read now, like read what's Mm -hmm. coming out, interact with people. Because a lot of times I have found that personally, when I hit my procrastination, when I hit that wall, when I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. It becomes from a place of, I'm not paying attention to the world around me anymore. I have somehow in the midst of all of these things, all these ideas, all these characters, all this world building, I've lost my voice. And this is no longer fun for me because I am trying to emulate a person that I was when I was 23, 24, 25, when I had this idea and I'm no longer being authentic to myself or I'm trying to mimic what other people are doing. And I'm just like, I don't know. And sometimes it takes a moment to like, center yourself, look back at what you have done, figure out who you are, what you're writing, why you're writing it, and to, you know, probably goes into what's on another panel, you know, figuring out who is your target audience, who are you writing this for, and imagining that one person, not a world of people, not a conglomerate of people, not a room of people, one person, who is that person who's going to pick up your book, sit in their room, sit in their couch with their tea, their coffee, their cat, their dog, who's going to enjoy this book, and then focus in on that, hone in on that. And for me, a lot of times I found that that is the easiest way to like work through the procrastination and to not feel so guilty for not writing because discovering yourself and discovering your writing is a process. And sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's really messy. And like Kristen said, sometimes you get burnt out. Sometimes it's just like, you just, it's a full stop. It's not a yellow light. It's not a yield. It's a full stop. (laughs) You have to recalibrate, you know, before you can keep moving. And it's okay if you don't know, like if you don't know what your voice is or if you think that it changes. And I think that really hits at a point that a lot of authors for various reasons, don't always recognize it's happening. You know, most people are not the same person after 10 years have passed. Um, And it is rarely a good thing if you are, because it means you haven't learned, you haven't experienced things. Not to say that people can't still be good after that period of time, but more often than not, that is not what happens. Um, With that said, like, you know, it's, it's something that, It took me like I I put out my second book earlier this year and I had finished writing it in mid to late 2022. And I haven't even started book three yet. And I was, you know, as I was preparing for this panel, I was thinking about, well, okay, why haven't I done that? You know, I, I have had some life things that have limited some of my time. I've had a couple of projects from an editing standpoint have taken up time, but like nothing that would prevent me from at least starting the book, finishing it, absolutely not because it's starting it, you know, not close. And, you know, as I kind of look back, you know, I wrote, I wrote the bulk of my first book, even though it came out in 2016, I wrote the bulk of it in 2011. And going back and reading that book uh, relatively recently and seeing, you know, where I was then versus where I am now, you know, it's drastically different. Like this is this is my third year being part of Right Hive. Uh, first to largely work as a moderator, um, but also being on the panel, and then you know, here. And this is the first time I've gone under this name to better align with my uh, gender identity, to better align with you know various things. And in retrospect, I got to that point thinking about, well, why have I been procrastinating on starting this? And it's like, oh no, you are literally a different person than you thought you were. 12, 15 years ago, whenever that started. Um, and granted, the changes for those, for individuals are not necessarily that drastic, to be clear. Mm-hmm. But it a, a, a change of who you are does not have to be necessarily a fundamental change of self. It could be that you have developed your points of view and developed your worldview, your literary view as a writer to, you know, shift off of the path you started on. And you know, you may have a series that you're midway through. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You can still tell the story you want to tell in the light as you have learned and told. Like my my series right now is 
sci-fi driven. It's focused on AI before that really became widely a thing in the larger world. And, you know, I'm going into book three being like, okay, well, AI is everywhere now. Um, I can't write anything stranger than what's happened to reality. How do I refocus that? <laughs> um, and I'm sure that there are people doing the same with less tech things. And I know that there are. And it's just about staying true to whatever that reality is for you at that point within your stories. You, you yeah, about- writing dystopia is wild right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't that write is. crazier than the real world. <laughs> You know, you, you, we're, we're all talking about the aspect of how we've evolved. But when you bring that back to the center of procrastination or bring it back into the storybook that you're writing, whether it's um, a standalone or an actual series, that character, that protagonist is being layered with so much information. You are building an identity there. And that's what I like to do when I come in and sit down at my computer. I like knowing and learning on the job how my character, Callie, is going to unfold things today because I am technically kind of a cross between a pantser and a plotter. I like to actually say, because I go by the Scott Bell method, but I'm a, a pantser by design, so Um, I do plan things out, but not to the extent a lot of people. I have um, mile markers where I steer towards. But what I'm saying is we put these characters down, flush them out on paper. We layer them um, as we go through the second edit, the third edit, add into the personality, add into the setting, add into the description, whether we're making it worse, better, better, Um, for that protagonist to ramp things up, add to the stakes, to really intensify because readers want angst. They want dystopian. They want something that moves them, you know, whether it's death on the first page or what, but they also like that character arc. As we evolve, those characters evolve. And it's really neat to see how things happen. And that's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that I don't like to procrastinate. I like that structured time sitting there. I like to sit down. I like to see how the muses are going to work through my head and how my character, um, went, cause I, I visualize what's going on. And then I type how things are going to unfold. It is so important that these characters are so real, so tangible that the reader could just, you know, understand them identify with them you know yeah. um especially with you writing the story chelsea it sounds like you really have to get into the crux of that identity of that character absolutely and that's something that i kind of wanted to add to um because sometimes there are especially if you're a younger writer right um because when you're in your your 20s or late teens 20s 30s a lot of your lived life experience is going to be figuring out who you are as a person how you are going to navigate the world as an adult what viewpoint you're forming your viewpoints you're forming your personalities you're making um active choices about who you are and who you will become. It's not just proximity. It's not just parents. It's not just environment. You choose your environment. Now you Mm -hmm. choose who you put in proximity to your life. And those things inform your writing in ways that I think a lot of people don't want to give credit to because some of us try to remove ourselves from our stories, right? It's like, oh, this character is not me. She's nothing like me, but also they are from our imagination. They are going to have aspects, like Cindy said, of us and who we are in our experiences no matter what you want to do. So if you are listening to this, I think one of the things that I had to kind of figure out for myself is that sometimes procrastination doesn't appear because, you know, you're just like frozen. Sometimes it's a time to reevaluate, like I said, who you are, because Mm -hmm. the thing is, if you're writing a character arc, right? Like, and we are the origin. One of the character arts that my character goes through is leaving everything that she has known and having to make active choices about what she is going to do. That is the crux of it. Is she going to side with the gods or is she going to remain loyal to the queendom that she has always served? What is she going to do? And for me, I could not write that story even though I had the idea as a teenager. I could not write that story until I was 24 when I was 
through that personal growth journey that I had to go through Mm -hmm. because I couldn't write an ending to a character arc that I had not lived through and experienced for myself yet. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we have to give ourselves space to live and to experience, especially when we're younger, especially when you're in your twenties and your in early thirties to be like, I am currently living through this thing. Therefore, I cannot write an ending to it yet. And sometimes your procrastination is just giving yourself space to write the, write the story and to live the life so that it can be what you want it to be. So you can address the theme because there's the saying that's saying like, you know, I know like when you're writing, it's like, Mm, I know how I want to write my story. I know how I want to convey it. I don't have the skill to convey it the way that I want to yet. It's like, the, what is the phrasing? It's like a musician whose ear is true, but their fingers aren't there yet. That is also a thing that applies to writing, in my opinion. So mm-hmm. it's just like giving yourself space to experience that and be okay with it. Because when, sometimes when you try to force it, Sometimes you lose sight of what you're trying to do. And I think it's okay to continue and to press forward because sometimes that's what you need to do. And that's why I also say you have to kind of check in with yourself because only you know if you're in a place to push forward. But if you're in a place and you're like, I'm hitting a roadblock, I just truly, (laughs) true to God, do not know where to go from here. Sometimes that's a sign that you're not ready to write the story the way that you want to write the story. And that's okay. Sometimes you just need to set it aside and let it breathe before you're ready to come back to it. And that's why, you know, sometimes it's okay to have a side project. It's okay to have a little side piece. It's okay. Your main story is not going to be mad at you, but that's, that's definitely something I would agree with. I call it letting the story marinate. (laughs) Sometimes the story needs to marinate for a long time before it's tender enough for me to tackle it. Absolutely. And also remember that when you're looking at these books, these finished products, you're looking at a finished product. That book on the shelf has been through so many revisions, so many drafts, so many cuts, so many editors, so many beta readers, so many alpha readers, so many nights of, oh my God, what am I doing? Is this even my calling? Like it's been through so much already. So when you're sitting down to write yours, it's like, remember you have your first coat of paint or your second coat of paint. There's still so much ahead of you and that's okay like it's okay to be like it's not there yet but understand that this whole thing is a process and it's okay to be like okay I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna dedicate time to it and work through it the way that you need to work through it at the end of the day I always say that authoring is a writing journey because it's a journey and everybody's journey is different the end point is not always the same. Some people are going to be indie. Some people are going to be traditional. Some people are going to be self-published. Some people just need to get the story out of them. It will never see the light of day. But also, it's okay if you are like, no, this is where I'm going. And it's okay to rewrite the whole story. It's okay to change the idea. Like Morgan said, it's okay to be like, I wrote this thing and I loved it. However, it no longer resonates with me. So I'm going to take this one piece of it that I love and I'm going to restructure it into something completely different. Mm -hmm. So much great advice in that question. I think we're about at time. Um, If anyone has any final thoughts or uh, I have a last question of sort of self-promotion, if you will, Um, how have these techniques help you to tackle procrastination? Um, What have these techniques help you achieve? Um, I can say that for me, it has helped me go from multiple stages of my career, from starting out as I want to write books, to I am writing books, to I'm a published author with multiple books in bookstores across the nation and internationally, right? It helps me to be like mile markers, essentially, on the journey. Like, yeah, I can look back and see where I was, and I can pinpoint the moment where things changed. And even going forward, I can tell you that my my journey, my authoring where it was last year is not where it is currently. Things have changed. I've adjusted my system. I've recalibrated. I've kind of narrowed the focus. I've honed in on this is what it is that I'm trying to achieve. This is what I want to do. These are the goals that I have. 
this is my accountability setup. This is who I'm, this is what I'm taking seriously. This is what I'm letting go of and giving myself grace for. And this is how I am moving going forward. And I fully expect (laughs) that in another year or two, I'm going to have another recalibration moment where it's going to be like, okay, what was working for me now in this moment is not going to be working for me for future Chelsea. And just being like, that's okay. The system, the system works as long as you allow the system to work. And when it's not, get a new system. There is no reason to be like, oh, I have always loved Scrivener. I will forever be a Scrivener person. It's not working for you anymore. It's not working for you anymore. Any final thoughts, Cindy? Um, I agree with a lot of what Chelsea is saying. I truly believe that, um, this, I have been writing for at least 10 years. I actually have gone through setting things up to where I was uh, gonna go the self-publishing route, hired a publicist, and then somebody that I knew said, hey, Cindy, I wanna represent you. So I took that learning curve. I was like, okay, I signed on with him, signed the DNA. And through that course of time, I was able to finish the five books for the complete series, the Theron series. So I'm at that point now, hey, do we have a publisher? What's going on? But then the industry is changing so much. Mm-hmm. And I'm learning so much through this industry. But at the same time, my agent closed his business. So I'm learning so much. But at the same time, I'm sitting back here thinking, I've got five books. What do I do? All of a sudden, things are just like falling into place. There, are, I've got over 4,000 words. Uh, between these five books. And it's like, I have got the set ready to do a hard launch. And so just as of last week, um, because of the accomplishments and not procrastinating, I just signed with somebody and we'll see where it goes. But it's it's a journey. It's an author's journey. It's actually quite a dream too, you know? But um, that's pretty much all I could say. Yeah, congrats on signing with someone. <laughs> that's exciting. Um, Kristen, any final thoughts? I would say that um, overcoming procrastination, and overcoming burnout, I'm getting back in and finishing my trilogy. So that's like my big goal for this year, next year is to like finish my YA trilogy and then like keep tackling my other series that I have. So I'm excited to finish projects. (laughs) Morgan, what about you? Yeah. So I, I come at this from a little bit, a little bit of a different angle. You know, I, I got signed to a publishing contract in 2015 only for the publishing house I was signed with to go out of business three months before my book release. And it forced me to go down the indie route. And I, on one hand, you know, I'm I'm very grateful that I was able to do that because it has allowed me to meet a ton of folks, uh, both from an editing standpoint and uh, as an author that you know, it's a very unique experience. It's something that procrastination and stress and everything takes hold. It takes hold in so many ways. You know, for some folks, it's they don't have, you know, the discipline to want, you know, whatever whatever it may be uh, to do the writing on a regular basis, but they excel at social media. They excel at promoting their book. Uh, Me, I'm over here. Please do not put me on video. Video is not good. Um, Whereas... (laughs) Uh, whereas like I can go, I can go right, but it's because, you know, I don't have the time not to in some cases. So, um, procrastination affects everyone a little bit differently. And I think that it is in a, in a unique way, uh, for folks on the indie side as I am, uh, something that hits everyone a little bit differently, just because there are so many facets that you have to take care of for yourself, whether, whether you are going to query to go down the traditional path or not. Um, you know, there's just so many facets that it's hard to keep track of everything and combine that on top of all the stuff that you need to do to write the book, to tell the story you want to, and it can be overwhelming and can lead to procrastination. Um, and, you know, just setting realistic expectations for yourself and doing your best either uh, to pace yourself or if you are burning out, put yourself in a position where you can, you know, 
help your mental health and then come back. So you can then come back and do the things you want to do, do things you need to do. It's a balance. Um, I'm certainly not perfect at it, but I think with, uh, I think with time, it's something that we learn with practice and effort. Thank you everybody for chatting today and having this discussion. There's definitely a lot of helpful lessons that I've learned and might take some of your quotes and put them on post-its around, <laughs> around my house. Um, all right. So have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Take care, guys.